Her career was marrying millionaires, literally. Peggy Upton Archer Hopkins Joyce Monet Eastern Meyer was a jazz age femme fatale who was notorious for marrying millionaires. She was a gold digger. Many sources say that she is widely regarded as the original target of that term. Born a barber's daughter at a time when one's station in life or socioeconomic status was pretty much the same from cradle to grave, Peggy was determined to be more than just a barber's daughter from Berkeley, Virginia. She was determined to not have a dull and dreary life, and she didn't. In fact, after running away from home at the age of 16 with a vaudeville bicyclist of all things, she made such an exciting life for herself that the tabloid press found her irresistible. And what made her so interesting? The rich men who decided to have her in their beds. You see, Kim Kardashian is nothing new. A woman who had no discernible talent, but was desperate to be in the spotlight. A woman who couldn't get any attention from the press without being attached to a millionaire. Are we talking about Peggy Hopkins Joyce or Kim Kardashian at this point? Well, Peggy made her way into the lifestyle that she wanted by riding the coattails of some of the richest men of her time. Theater owner-operator Lee Schubert, film producer Irving Thalberg, automotive industry executive Walter Chrysler, multimillionaire lumberman J. Stanley Joyce, and comic actor, filmmaker, and composer Charlie Chaplin, just to name a few who were on her roster and they all had deep pockets. Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about your favorite and most scandalous figures from yesteryear that make the Ty Said What Ty Said channel a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream and comment I subscribed in the comment section so that I can say hello to you. Now, on to why you are here. If you ask the question, what is true love? Depending on who you ask and his or her life experience, the answers will vary. Had you been able to ask Peggy Joyce Hopkins, she would likely have told you this quote of hers. True love was a heavy diamond bracelet, preferably one that arrived with its price tag intact. So. We know that she left home with that vaudeville bicyclist. Did he strike it big with his bicycle act and then lavish her with extravagant gifts? No. The story is that in 1910, the young couple were on their way to Denver, Colorado by train when Peggy encountered Everett Archibald Jr., a millionaire. She dropped that bicyclist and got herself a hero. Apparently, she lied about her age to her millionaire husband because Everett had the marriage annulled after six months when he discovered that Peggy was underage. Her story of why they divorced is different. She said that she wanted the divorce because life as a millionaire's wife was, quote, not at all what I thought it might be and I was bored to death, end quote. I guess that I'll have to believe his side of the story because she would go on to pursue several millionaires in her following years. After her divorce, Peggy attended the private Chevy Chase School for Girls in Washington, D.C. This is where she met her second husband, attorney Sherburn Philbrick Hopkins. They were married on September 1st, 1913, just three years after marrying her first husband. But this time, she was of legal age, at 20. She stuck around for a while. Then, in 1917, Peggy left her second husband to pursue an entertainment career. She found work. Peggy was hired as a Ziegfeld showgirl who would also occasionally act. Most sources say that she had little to no real talent, but where her talent failed her, 
her opportunistic instincts more than compensated. Like most harlots, she had perfected the art of the adoring gaze and inviting smile. But unlike most harlots, the men who paid for her <clears throat> time were millionaires. And in 1919, she met multimillionaire Chicago lumberman J. Stanley Joyce, and they made plans to marry. You might notice that I never mentioned her second divorce. That's because by the time that she was planning to marry Stanley Joyce, she hadn't gotten one. Her new fiance, J. Stanley Joyce, paid for Peggy's divorce from Sherburn Hopkins. Their divorce was granted on January 21st, 1920. Then, on January 23rd, Peggy and J. Stanley Joyce were married. He became her third husband, yes, just two days after her divorce was finalized. This marriage did not go at all the way that J. Stanley wanted it to go, because Peggy started with her obvious gold digging right away. On the couple's wedding night, Peggy locked herself in the bathroom of the couple's hotel room and refused to come out until he wrote her a check for $500,000. Being married to J. Stanley allowed her to be with her one true love, money. To a lesser degree, she also loved fame, but she knew that because of her lack of talent, that hers would likely not last for long. So she milked it for all that it was worth. Peggy Joyce never refused an interview. And often when she would receive tabloid reporters at her place of residence, she would receive them in her bedroom. That alone was scandalous enough for the 1920s. But not only would Peggy Joyce receive these male reporters in her bedroom, she had a habit of being interviewed while wearing see-through lingerie. Hey, when you can't sing or act or dance well, you have to give the entertainment reporters something entertaining to write about. And she did, thus turning what should have been her 15 minutes of fame into 15 years. She made no apologies for using her physical assets in order to gain access to luxury living. If I had to guess the words that she lived by, I'd guess, you've got to use what you have to get what you want. She was once actually quoted as saying, better to be mercenary than miserable. Peggy Joyce lived her life as a woman on the prowl, and her hunting ground was New York City. New York City in the 1920s was the perfect spot for a free spirit between husbands or a newlywed on a honeymoon shopping spree. In the spring of 1920, the new Mrs. Stanley Joyce spent $1 million dollars in a single week, buying $300,000 worth of pearls, a $65,000 Russian sable coat, and a $30,000 chinchilla fur coat. This extravagance sparked a story soon to be propelled by a scandalous divorce. In the first year of the marriage, she left Stanley Joyce for Parisian multimillionaire newspaper owner Henri Letelier. Then, in a show of pure audacity, she sued J. Stanley Joyce for a divorce and asked for $10,000 a month in alimony and attorney fees of $100,000. But J. Stanley Joyce wasn't going down without a fight. He may have willingly paid for her second divorce, but he wanted her to pay in every way for this third one from him. He countersued, claiming that she had married him only to defraud him of money. He also accused Peggy of having multiple adulterous affairs, and he accused her of being a bigamist. According to Stanley Joyce, Peggy was not divorced from her first husband before she married her second husband, thus making their union invalid, or so he hoped. And lastly, he accused her of having driven a United States Army lieutenant to suicide. J. Stanley Joyce's lawyer claimed that the lieutenant shot himself in a Turkish bath after going broke, trying to keep Peggy happy. This is certainly on par with how a couple of Peggy's affairs ended, but I can't confirm this particular story, 
because even though Stanley Joyce insisted that it was true, he never disclosed this lieutenant's name. He said out of respect for his family. Everything about this divorce was over the top and well publicized. And the press was not on Peggy's side. See this 1921 article from the San Pedro News Pilot, one of many of the newspapers that reported on these divorce proceedings. She is referred to as Peggy with a past and a wallet devouring goat. It is revealed that Jay Stanley had given Peggy Joyce a reported $1.4 million in jewelry, a $300,000 home in Miami, and multiple furs, cars, and other properties during their marriage. In the end, Stanley would not get what he wanted. Peggy was awarded $600,000 in the divorce settlement. She was also allowed to keep all of the jewelry she had acquired during the marriage, and she was awarded stock in J. Stanley Joyce's lumber company that gave her an annuity of $1,500 a month for life. Now, just for the record, this settlement wasn't enough to break J. Stanley Joyce. He was worth $40 million. I haven't done any of the inflation calculations in this story because I have rattled off so many dollar amounts already. But just to put things into perspective, let's look at the amounts Peggy was awarded in the divorce settlements. Just the money. $600,000 lump sum and $1,500 a month from her stock annuity. That $600,000 in 1921 has the buying power of $9.3 million today in 2022. And that $1,500 a month translates to a measly $23,000 a month for life. Chump change, right? Well, for Jay Stanley Joyce, it actually was. He just wanted to make an example of his wife for playing him. But his $40 million net worth in 1921 translates to more than half a billion dollars, $623 million in 2022. So he was definitely more than okay when the divorce was over. Kind of off the subject, but if you want to tell me what you would do with an extra $23,000 a month, I'd love to know. Put your answers in the comment section. This should be fun. After the divorce from J. Stanley Joyce, incorrect reports that Peggy had eloped with her rich French newspaper man, Henri Latelier, started to circulate. She later said that she didn't marry him because, quote, Frenchmen understand women too well. A girl should never marry a man who understands women, end quote. Well, that certainly says a lot. After this, her third divorce, Peggy Joyce declared that she would never marry again. And she didn't. For a while. She spent the next few years having romantic affairs with wealthy men. There was W. Averill Harriman, the politician, businessman, and son of a railroad baron. Then there was Prince Christopher of Greece and Denmark, the prince. Then there was Hiram Bloomingdale, the son of Lyman Bloomingdale, who was the founder of Bloomingdale's department store. Then there was Sayadurao Gaikwad III, the Maharaja of Baroda State, who was born into the royal Gaikwad family. And then there was Charlie Chaplin, millionaire film star, who was the most famous celebrity of his time. She had an affair with him in between his first and second marriages. Charlie even drew inspiration from her life for his film called A Woman of Paris, which was partly based on stories that Peggy Joyce told him about her marriage to J. Stanley Joyce. Then there was Irving Thalberg, who was called the boy wonder in Hollywood because he was an expert producer who was great at selecting scripts and actors. Every one of her affairs made headlines, but her affair with Guillermo Errazuriz made the news because of what was going on outside of their bedroom time. Guillermo was a Chilean diplomat whose mother just happened to be the richest woman in Chile 
Five years before his affair with Peggy, his sister, Blanca, had killed her ex-husband because of a custody dispute over their son. Long story short, she got away with it. Though she was acquitted, her name was still a scandal by the time that Peggy was involved with Guillermo. But here came Art again, imitating life. A silent film called The Woman and the Law was made about Blanca killing her child's father and Peggy got a part in the movie. While Peggy was still seeing her French newspaper owner Henri, she started cheating on him with her Chilean lover, Guillermo. And when she broke things off with Guillermo to move on, sad headlines would follow the breakup. Headlines that read something like, Guillermo Erasuriz kills himself after being rejected by Peggy Hopkins Joyce. Yes, on May 1st, 1922, Guillermo shot himself in Peggy's hotel room and he died the following day. Peggy said that he did it because she turned down his marriage proposal. His family, in an effort to save face, said that he killed himself due to his financial troubles. But it seems that this time, she at least felt something for her former lover because three days after his death, Peggy was hospitalized after accidentally overdosing on sleeping pills. She told a reporter that she loved Guillermo and she played with him. She didn't know why she did it. She didn't know why men ran after her and she didn't mean to ruin their lives. Then, just six days later, one more life was affected, if not ruined because of her, when another Chilean diplomat she was also involved with tried to take his life. Reportedly, Lieutenant Riva Munt could not handle the fact that Peggy didn't want to be with him and that she really loved his fellow countrymen and diplomat. So he attempted suicide by overdosing on Veronal, a barbiturate that was used as a sleep remedy. He was found clutching the newspaper article in which Peggy Joyce declared her love for Guillermo. All three of these suicides and attempt happened in a matter of nine days. Two years later, Peggy Hopkins Joyce married again, this time to Gosta Murner, a Swedish count. She told the press that this was her first time truly being in love, and he bragged that she gave up her career in order to be his wife. Well, I think that we know where this is going. Not even two months into their marriage, she left him to resume her career. The couple divorced two years later. After the divorce, she remained single, but she continued to have sexual affairs. On her 1930s roster was Walter Chrysler, automotive executive and namesake of American Chrysler Corporation. While the two were having their affair, Walter Chrysler was a married man but that didn't stop him from giving her $2 million in jewelry, including a 134 carat diamond necklace, and two Isota Raschini's Italian luxury cars that cost $45,000 a piece. Am I the only one wondering why he didn't just give her a top of the line Chrysler? Peggy was a woman whose career was her love life. The most important aspect of her job, if you will, was attracting wealthy men. And there are requirements that come along with that. The main one for her was to be attractive. But somewhere around the age of 40, she committed the irremissible crime of <laughs> aging. Peggy's 40 was a rough 40. She was no longer the slender fashion plate who had men risking everything, including their marriages and reputations, just for the chance to be with her. She gained a very noticeable amount of weight. She had become sloppy and unkempt. Adding to her unattractiveness were the facts that she now was an alcoholic and heavily in debt. Where had all of the gold diggers' dollars gone? The former good-looking, good-time girl was reduced to a laughing stock. 
a punchline for tasteless jokes made by people who thought she was getting what she deserved by being sentenced to live the rest of her days too broke and too fat and too ugly to attract another wealthy man who she could destroy. There were better things going on than this talentless broad. The former beauty who loved the spotlight almost as much as she loved money would now have to live with the fact that she was yesterday's news. She would find love again, just not with the caliber of men that she had in her younger, thinner, prettier days. Her next lover was Charles Vivian Jackson, a British astronomy professor who became her fiance. She was 41 by this time. He was only 30. And when he proposed marriage to her with a sapphire ring that cost 6,500 pounds, he was already married. One of the engagement announcements read that he, quote, was expecting divorce proceedings against him, end quote. My, my. When the couple went to St. Moritz in 1937, he died in a slaying accident. As far as I know, she wasn't a beneficiary on his life insurance policy, so I guess that it's safe to not suspect any foul play in his death. I guess. At some point, Peggy claimed that Charles was the only man who she had ever loved, but we've already heard that before. Well, Peggy's next fiancé didn't die. She made it down the aisle with him on December 3rd, 1945, her fifth marriage. This guy wasn't royalty or a big name in Hollywood either, so this marriage didn't make the headlines the way that many of her previous marriages and affairs had. His name was Anthony Easton, and he was a British engineer. Despite his not having a fancy career, their wedding made the headlines. Why? Because Peggy refused to include the word obey in her marriage vows. Well, at least she told the truth this time. There don't seem to be any records of a divorce in this fifth marriage for Peggy, but at some point the relationship ended. Whether it ended legally or not, I can't say. But I can say that Peggy Hopkins Joyce got married again one more time to one more man. And you know what they say, the six times the charm. Her sixth and final husband was Andrew C. Meyer. In a number of sources, he is referred to as a retired official of the Bankers Trust Company. That description was just a way of dressing up his real occupation. The truth is that he was just a bank teller. He met Peggy while he was working at the bank and she was coming in to complete a transaction. By the time she met him, she was up in age and he was probably the best catch that she could get. Who knows, maybe this time she really did love him. It seems as though he may have really loved her because Andrew stayed with Peggy until she died when she lost her battle with throat cancer on June 12th. 1957, aged 64. She is the patron saint of gold diggers, and these women need to thank her. Anna Nicole Smith, Marjorie Harvey, Kim Kardashian, Evelyn Lozada, and Kendu Isaacs. You owe a huge debt to Peggy for blazing a trail for you. That's Peggy Upton Archer Hopkins Joyce Murner Easton Meyer to you. Put some respect on her name. There's someone else who had a lot of marriages and sexual partners around the same time frame as Peggy Hopkins Joyce. Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight title boxing champion. I've already published a video about him and you can check that out here. My sources for this video are New York Times Archives, Men, Marriage, and Me by Peggy Hopkins Joyce, Genie.com, San Pedro News Pilot Archive 1921, Top Photo UK, 
San Francisco Call Archive 1921, Alcatron.com, and the Pittsburgh Press Archive 1921. If you want text notifications so that you can get a text 15 minutes before I release a video or 15 minutes before I live stream, simply send a text to 786-632-2135 to let me know that you want text and you will get an outgoing text message 15 minutes before I have a new video release. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Ty Said What Ty Said channel. Please leave a thumbs up and comment so that we can get a discussion going and share this video on all of your social media, especially your Facebook. That really helps me out a lot and subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know when my next video is ready for you. And if you don't like what I'm saying, but you love it, feel free to hit that applaud button just below your video screen there and send me some donations, donations, donations. Yeah, baby. See you on the next video.